to Mahir Murshed, who will talk about uh, Wikidata lexemes uh, and how they can be used. Over sure. to you, Mahir. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Yon, and uh, good morning, Shuprabhat, Bore uh, Yachkat, I think, um, to all of you, and uh, welcome to a presentation on a subject which doesn't really get much coverage when you talk, when you think about abstract Wikipedia or what might uh, go into preparing it, which is, you know, how do you get your the information about your language, one of the languages which I presume you'd want content in, um, how might you prepare it for actually generating um, language using, um, you know, using this data? Um, and so that's what we're going to be discussing essentially for the next half hour. And I'm hoping that it's not terribly technical, but at least it should give you a th food for thought about, you know, how might you model your own language and uh, what is currently being done and what isn't currently being done. So we can start by talking about, okay, again, what's the big deal? Uh, well, we know that uh, abstract Wikipedia is coming. There's lots of development. If you go on Fabricator, there's always tasks being actioned and non-actioned uh, every hour. Um, it'll be powered, of course, not just by the information that exists on Wikidata as, as an initial basis, but by the wide world of functions that do all sorts of different things. And it's going to be very community driven. Uh, you know, anyone can, uh, it, ultimately, anyone should be able to write their own functions to do various things, including and especially, um, you know, uh, you know, pr pr manipulating language, essentially. Uh, unfortunately, as it, as it is, there's still a lot of preparation that needs to actually be done. And of course, it doesn't help that there isn't really um, a working prototype as far as um, operating complex functions goes. You can, run, you can run simple functions at the moment, um, as far as I've seen recently, but uh, nothing complex enough to be useful in other situations. So this is, again, a lot of preparation that needs to be done. Um, and I, I've started going into, you know, Lexemes and Abstract Wikipedia, but we should talk about what those things are for the first, uh, to start off. So first of all, lexemes, put very simply, are just like items for words. Um, and to elaborate on that, I mean, they're, they're essentially just objects that hold some sort of meaningful unit of a particular language. And that unit will have a number of different things. For example, uh, you know, the realizations that that unit can take on when you, you know, speak it or write it. Um, they're, they're called forms. Uh, one example for that is, you know, let's take the unit for the English word house. You know, there's the singular form house, which you use in a lot of situations. But when you can refer to the same thing using houses to indicate that it's the plural. And so house and houses are like different forms. Um, of course, that unit itself can also have different meanings. And house itself has different meanings or senses, such as, uh, you know, the, the abode where someone lives, or it can be a chamber of a legislature or it could be a number of different things. Um, as a verb, it could be, you know, to put something in one of these uh, abodes or chambers. Um, and even beyond that, you can indicate so much more, like the origin of, of the word, whether it's, you know, an etymological derivation or if it's a combination from different places or really anything else, um, and so much more. You know, we, we, this isn't really a lexeme session, unfortunately, uh, but, you know, you can... Um, see a lot of examples on, you know, uh, Jan Ainali's streams and uh, a number of other videos on what lexemes are, and we can go into those uh, uh, at a different time. Right now, there are more than 500,000 lexemes on Wikidata, and um, it, as a sort of uh, indication of how much work we have left to do, most of them only really have just forms. We don't know what these lexemes mean. We don't know where they come from. Uh, someone just took a bot and then created 100,000 lexemes on the fly. Uh, that's true for at least two languages, uh, maybe more. Um, so lexemes are the main units that this that abstract Wikipedia's text is gonna be ultimately based on. Now, what's abstract Wikipedia? This is again, a very uh, simplified um, assessment, but essentially it's just turning these I ideas you might have into sentences in your language. And uh, to put it a bit less simply, it, it's, I, from what I've heard, Denny doesn't want to describe it as like a separate project for say. He has actually described it as a separate system or the, the last few newsletters have described it as a side system, if you will, for distributing knowledge whereby we have these objects that represent various things, be the items, properties, or these new concepts called Z objects, which are going to be used to power wiki functions. Uh, it should be possible with these things called constructors to sort of join them together into complex ideas. So you might have an object 
for the concept of something being tall. You might have a concept for Mount Everest, or I guess an item. And you might have uh, a concept for some super superlative aspect to, to say that, you know, Mount Everest is the tallest mountain. Uh, you might get, want to join these concepts together uh, using these constructors and then transform them um, ultimately, the, the structure that results from these constructors into natural language. Um, this discussion, as will turn out, will consider mainly the last of these, the, the transformation into natural language, because that's where lexemes are going to, going to come in. Although, of course, what I will be discussing today might have implications for the constructors when they're actually developed. Uh, which brings us to some just general questions that we might have about, you know, the relationships between lexemes and abstract Wikipedia functions. Um, and because functions themselves are, can, be, can do so many different things, and, or at least that is the intention, there hasn't been any talk of restricting the kinds of objects we can use in those functions. There's a number of related questions that we can talk about, we can bring up in, with respect to, you know, what belongs in lexemes themselves and what belongs in wiki functions functions. So, um, for example, we can think about, okay, just in terms of storage, you know, what information is better kept in lexemes to be used in functions and what information is better left in functions themselves to just know of immediately and, and process lexemes based on that. Um, and in both of those cases, we need to uh, determine, okay, how should we be structuring these things? Um, there's obviously a lot of debate in some circles about uh, how to model pronunciations or uh, origins um, in, in terms of the complexities that uh, come out of those. Uh, a similar question might be set of functions. Um, you know, it, it, it could come down to an implementation issue okay, because, um, you know, wiki functions, functions can be written in a number of different languages. Maybe Python's not your thing. Maybe you need to do it in Java. Or maybe you might have one very large function or a number of different smaller functions. Uh, these two different you know, sets of objects might have different references to other items, other lexemes in terms of, um, you know, again, what, what outside knowledge is needed um, on either end to make informed decisions about, okay, what do I use to make set phrases in, in a particular set, in a particular uh, form of, of, or sense of different sorts. Yes, I just used form and sense in very different ways from what I described previously. Um, and, you know, once you uh, have this scope of outside knowledge defined, you, the question just becomes, okay, how can we form these lexemes, these individual units, into sentences? Uh, there, there has to be some structure around it. So how do we create this structure? And what functions do I call to actually make the structure happen? Um, so those are the general questions that I mentioned, but uh, there's a two couple of things that I want to uh, bring up in terms of um, just ideas that you should keep in mind just because we're dealing with natural language here. So the first thing we need to consider is that, well, um, there are functions that need to expect the existence of certain forms. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with things in the past tense, you might expect that lexemes will have a past tense form. But of course, not all uh, objects that we you know, process for generating language are going to necessarily have lexemes. I mean, language is changing all the time and you might import new um, ideas. Uh, it may be a bit uh, more tedious uh, in that case to uh, expect lexemes to be created on the fly uh, at that point. Uh, and so basically any function that you do decide to create should have some sort of a fallback attached to it. You know, if there isn't a form, for your particular purpose, you should be able to generate that form uh, on the fly. And of course, similarly, you know, if, if we want to uh, assemble, for example, a noun phrase, an adjective phrase, um, it's important that whatever functions you do use to perform these transformations have some sort of a base case, something that you can apply regardless of the other words around it. And this need not be the way that you might treat normal words, because of course, uh, may, may be better that you use the paradigms for formal for foreign phrases, sorry, uh, in that case. And of course, uh, if you alter meanings uh, or process meanings of, uh, or process words depending on their meanings, you should assume something about the meaning to begin with uh, for unknown words. So again, th that's fallbacks, um, ultimately. It's one thing you should pay attention to. Another thing is because of the flexibility of language, in, in addition to its you know productivity in terms of bringing in words, uh, it, it should be possible in, in most cases, or in many cases, to make the behavior of the functions that you use overridable somehow. 
So, for example, if you have an adjective phrase and the article uh, it, it comes at the beginning of the phrase, it should be possible to override that somehow. And or, or if you uh, are specifying that a particular past tense form has a certain suffix, you might want to change that suffix in certain situations, uh, things like that. Uh, if there are irregularities or valid variations, again, and they're not consistently applied, applied exceptions, it should still be possible to apply them. Because again, I mean, uh, just because a Wikipedia, just because a Wikipedia or any encyclopedia uh, it should have very standardized text doesn't mean that the sentences themselves should be very rigid. I mean, Wikipedia would not be fun to read if all of the sentences had a very strict, you know, structure to them. Um, st strict meaning, uh, just grammatically speaking. And of course, um, th 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 there can be some limits to this. It's something you can decide as a language community for yourself. Uh, maybe the Northern Sami uh, sentences are going to be more flexible than the Skult Sami languages. Who knows? Um, that's something that a uh, community has to decide. So enough about generalities. We'll go into just uh, some different facets, and I'll bring up examples um, from Bengali, or the language that I speak, um, in terms of how uh, we might handle these in that language. Sorry for the lack of uh, Nordic examples, but I do not speak any of them. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, we begin with uh, morphological model, you know, dealing with the construction of words. Uh, the question here, sort of harkening back to the first of the general questions, is what forms of words are better listed on a lexeme, and what forms are better generated on the fly? Uh, and this is something that is, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the lexeme forms tool that uh, Lucas Berkmeister created, you sort of see what decisions people have made in terms of the number of forms that are used. You know, maybe you only need one. Um, because grammar around it is expressed in other ways. Or maybe you need a particularly important set of forms. I think most languages uh, that currently have templates uh, are sort of in that second bullet point because you know uh, they have maybe a certain set of uh, noun declensions or verb conjugations. And so um, you know there's only uh, so much that really needs to be specified, listed out in order for things to happen later. Uh, and of course, there are languages like Basque and Swahili, which have a bunch of different variations. And you know, uh, beyond that, there's also the question of how much uncertainty among dialects should you keep on these lexemes. Uh, and, and to discuss these, I mean, we can talk about uh, how Bengali does things. So on the left column, we see forms for a Bengali noun. And on the right, we see maybe a quarter of the forms on a Bengali verb. Um, and we've made the decision as, as a language community to only really use four and maybe five different forms on nouns, uh, and then specify the hundred or so forms on verbs because they're not easily you know, generatable, or at least they're important enough for our purposes that they're worth specifying in, uh, in a particular verb like scene. Uh, those are sort of the exceptions in terms of multiple forms because most other parts of speech in Bengali only have maybe one form usually. Uh, pronouns, to, of course, similar to nouns. Adjectives might have extra forms depending on their origin. And then we would talk about words in regional varieties uh, in the sense that these are assessed to be in regional varieties and not the standard language. For those, we only really add one form because the inflection patterns around them are not necessarily standardized. And so picking one and adding forms for that is assuming a bit much, um, whereas for standardized Bengali, that's not really a concern. And of course, and the one form that is given is usually one that's referenced to some dictionary or some external use. And at that point, you know, we would need functions to generate the inflections with wiki functions. Um, so that sort of gives you an idea of how form, you know, morphological modeling sort of runs the gamut in terms of uh, Bengali parts of speech. Uh, and of course, um, you know, we, we don't have to consider just individual words. I mean, there might be lexemes that consist of multiple words and they ha that has an idiomatic or some meaning that isn't just the sum of its individual parts. Um, and in this case, uh, when we talk about manipulating structure, it's useful to try to annotate these multi-part lexemes in terms of their, comp their combining parts to specify, okay, there, there's some syntactic relationship uh, between them, right? Um, it, for example, we have the English jump the gun. Um, we conjugate the word jump and then um, the gun is just some, um, you know, uh, is, is like a direct object, uh, if you will. Uh, or in Bengali, there's the a phrase to fry fish in fish oil. Um, you know, it, it, has an idiom, it, it's a, it has a proverbial meaning, but it's not inconceivable that we can substitute out maybe 
uh, either of the nouns or the verb to come up with some derivative meaning, if you, if you will, uh, based on the proverb, the, the proverb in that case. Similarly for Spanish, there's a uh, there's a proverb or there's a there's an idiom like like oil and water, and uh, surely changing one of the liquids is, is productive. Um, now, um, unfortunately, these these properties for marketing these relationships don't quite exist yet, in part because the the act the specific syntactic tree structure paradigm that we might be using for these wiki functions um, doesn't isn't quite defined yet, and and for these um, properties to exist, we would need to, uh, you know, make a decision as to what needs to be done, rather than, I guess, myself doing it unilaterally. So while the properties don't exist yet, it's still something worth preparing for. Um, so that's sort of talking about morphology, um, one level of the path to generating language. We move on now to syntax, um, which, of course, dealing, which of course deals with the construction of phrases. Uh, we might have to talk, and, and so this is something you, um, for, for those languages which do have a lot of lexemes, you can start to sit down and think, how might you model different portions of a sentence, uh, different types of phrases or different subphrases? Because, you know, uh, you, you might, uh, you, if you utter a sentence, you, there's going to be some structure around it, and you need to be able to model that structure to reproduce it in, in uh, the abstract Wikipedia. Uh, it might come down to sitting down with some grammars or linguists familiar with your language. Um, I have done this <laughs> a fair amount um, in, in actually both of those cases. Um, in, with respect to uh, d doing this for Bengali, and the and as a language community, we made some decisions about um, the rules that uh, might be used to express them. Um, and of course, they, they may not be consistent across the resources that, that you consult. So there's some trade-offs that you need to uh, make uh, and uh, be clear about how to deal with um, once you decide to build them out into functions. Um, and this last part, of course, building out the functions is a bit. Uh, it may be a bit difficult or daunting at first, but of course, um, you know. But when the, when the project yeah, gets launched, we can uh, you can see how other languages start to do it, assuming that they that their communities have a better knack for what wiki functions um, can do or how to build functions in wiki functions. So, as an example of the sorts of rules that we might de develop for syntax, um, you know, here's uh, just. Uh, a, a short example for uh, mappings to Bengali forms of a particular verb. This is the verb for to do. Uh, you, generally speaking, you know, we might want to feed in a particular tense, a particular aspect, a particular mood. These are synthesized from other abstract concepts, like this is taking place now, and we're talking about it from a past perspective, and so on and so forth. Um, but sp basically speaking, if, we, if there is a form for a particular combination of grammatical features, just use it. And if there's a Otherwise, if there's um, a particular set of, of features for which a paraphrastic construction is necessary, or basically a construction with multiple words, uh, it should be it possible to alter the structure of the phrase or the, the clause ar around it to handle that accordingly. So in, in Bengali, some of these examples include the continuative aspect, uh, the passive voice, and in some certain situations, the perfective aspect uh, for things that have been done but are but you want to emphasize the fact that they're finished. Uh, and I should remind you again that, you know, if these forms don't exist, you should uh, generate them uh, on the fly if necessary. Um, another example uh, might be the handling of subject and object placement in, in Bengali. Um, well, and, and while I'm discussing this, I mean, you should know that like, of course not, uh, there's gonna be a lot of languages that process these things very similarly. And so it might be beneficial to to have a look at, okay, how do other languages deal with these phenomena and maybe m adapt them to your use case. So, um, you know, when adding a subject, you might add it to the start of a clause and then check what it is. And if it's a particular pronoun, then um, use a, a, then change the verb to, you know, inflect for that particular person. Otherwise, use it for the regular third person. Uh, and But of course, um, if your subject is, is something you want to Refer to formally, and in Bengali this is possible, you might want to specify via an override that yes, we want to change the verb to use the formal person instead of the third person. Uh, similarly for objects, um, usually speaking, you know, you add them right before the verb, and then um, if the noun phrase is animate, you modify it. If it's not, then you don't. Um, but of course, in, in certain circumstances, you might need to add um, certain suffixes um, or reverse these situations, essentially. So those are things you would need to uh, handle, at least in Bengali. Uh, 
And I can imagine that for um, you know a number of for other languages, BDs agglutinating or uh, polysynthetic, a, a lot of these rules will need to be made in terms of um, developing functions for these. Um, so, uh, and then they might even they might fall in the syntactic realm, even if they're just co combining different parts to form very long uh, compounds. So that was syntactic modeling ultimately, and we're halfway there. Don't don't. Don't worry. Um, so we're, we can start by talking about, okay, we've dealt with a lot of structural aspects, but let's talk about semantic aspects. This is actually something uh, key here because this is uh, the first step in getting to these abstract ideas that I mentioned. I, I map it from items, properties, Z objects, and their constructors to languages. We should know how meeting correspondences exist between languages uh, in this case. Um, in, on, on Wikidata, there are a number of properties that we can use to link senses in, 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 the, in a way to structurally define um, or structurally relate the meanings of a word to other words and other concepts. Uh, one way to do that is to map them to a Wikidata item. And if, it, you're, and if you're confident that the meaning that you specify maps very clearly to that item, all the better for you. Um, it's also possible to map them to other sentences via which a translation or synonym network might be formed. Um, and these networks, I should mention, are networks and not just like a single hub and then spokes outside, because that would defeat, it, it would not only defeat the purpose of the abstract Wikipedia, but it would also um, make translations very um, erratic and possibly uh, problematic. For example, in, in this case, you see that there's links from Scottish Gael Gaelic to English to West Frisian to German to Polish to Belarusian to Russian. Um, note that these are both these are all genealogical or geographical or etymological in terms of closeness, rather than, for example, linking everything to Russian, and uh, because that's been done for a number of lexemes, and I have to fix that. Um, of, and, and of course, I should emphasize that if this network fails you in a certain sense, maybe the West Frisian word has some context, this has some implication that the other words don't. It's better to break one of these links than imply that that implication exists in the in the other words. Uh, and of course, you know, the, these translation or synonym statements, you might want to qualify them um, because the qualifiers might be useful. Um, the, the example that was given in one of Denny's newsletters was um, the idea of cat uh, in English, French, and German. Um, the fact that English has a single word and the German and German has two words and the French word can be uh, adjusted based on gender or something like that. Um, so if you wanted to make a link from the English word to the German word, you'd have to specify via qualifiers that it's not just uh, a cat, uh, a katza is not just a cat, it's a feminine cat, things like that. Sorry about the, uh, I, I want to get this in within a half hour so we can uh, get moved to questions, but so sorry for going a bit fast. Um, uh, and in terms of like, you know, um, meaning correspondences, here's some examples um, with respect to the Bengali word for sun. Um, so, for example, um, you know, there's the regular word shurjo, which is borrowed from Sanskrit, and we might want to, we might attach it via translation to um, close cognates in other Eastern Indo-Aryan languages and senses that are at least geographically close. So maybe uh, in Assamese and Oriya and Bhojpuri, which are close by languages, um, for this basically the same etymologically similar word. Uh, there are of course other words. Um, Po poetic borrowings from Sanskrit, um, they, they're not very well used, but they do exist in um, literature and things like that. So, um, you know, we might want to include translation with the original Sanskrit words because they have the same meaning of sun. There's also Persianized borrowings because history is like that. Um, so the word aftab might be linked to the uh, Persian word of the same uh, of the same word. And then uh, also if that word happens to appear in other Indo-Aryan languages, we might want to attach it via translation to that. And all of these words that I mentioned here can be linked through a synonym path, uh, you know, using synonym, the synonym property with each, with each other. And all of them could be linked via the item for the sense property, which I mentioned, or I, I hinted at before, yeah, item for the sense. They could be linked, all of them, to the item for the sun. Uh, it, it's certainly possible to do that as well. Um, in terms of how to do this with multi-part lexemes, uh, here's an example between English and Bengali. The first two are sort of are sort of instances which I under would I would understand, you know, um, there to be sort of idiomatic meanings for the terms on the right. So, for so in, swim in English is mapped to um, 
a verb phrase meaning essentially swimming to cut swimming or something like that. Uh, but shatar kata has the idiomatic meaning to swim and, and it's consistent in, in that regard. So it's possible to have a separate lexeme for shatar kata and then adding the um, meaning to swim uh, in that case. Similarly for the Bengali verb buchana, which can be mapped to the English idiomatic phrase clean up or, or idiomatic, but essentially it, it's more than just clean plus up. Um, in the latter two cases, there are actually situations where um, in, the, in the target languages, it might not be worth it to have a separate idiomatic lexeme for the, uh, for the object in question. So uh, fish, uh, the verb uh, to fish in English might be mapped to uh, dhara in Bengali, which is essentially just um, fish, like catching fish, literally catching fish. Um, but um, that catching fish is, is essentially just a phrase. It's not something that has a separate idiomatic meaning. It is literally just the sum of its parts. So you might want to say, okay, it means dhara, but then the object in this case is fish. Similarly for the verb kamano in Bengali, that can be mapped to the verb earn with the specification that the object in question is money. Um, now, in, in terms of um, you know these qualifiers that we've added, uh, that will, of course, adjust the translation synonym paths involving these uh, these lexemes. And so one uh, part of one place for food for thought in terms of um, you know, mapping from conceptual objects to words is let's say we have an, a mapping from an object to an English word and then we follow a path to a Bengali word and there's qualifiers along the way. How do we process all of the qualifiers together? Uh, what do we use to modify um, the, exist the total result? Um, and, and how might we incorporate that processing into language generation? That's just some food for thought. I, um, it's not something I want to, to suggest ideas for because you know, well, uh, that comes down to how regular functions are built in the first place. Um, so that's semantic, uh, to, you know, ideas. And uh, now we move on to more pragmatic considerations um, because of course, um, languages are not monoliths, even if, uh, you know, there are uh, communities that might say so, uh, because, you know, certain lexemes, forms, senses, or even functions might have a particular provenance in a particular uh, community. Uh, and, uh, for your particular language, you might want to ask yourself just distinctions as simple as, you know, say rural urban or in between different communities or across an international border. Do, do distinctions in the language because of that suffice? Can you better finally specify where something is used uh, for like regionalisms and things like that? And of course, how fluid are the borders between these divisions? Can you <clears throat> meaningfully um, use terms from one side of the border and on the other side and so on and so forth? And can you ensure that some form or some rules are applied in certain situations, whether it's, you know, um, a particular regionalism, maybe you want to, um, you know, create a Peruvian Spanish uh, piece of text. May, uh, can you ensure that uh, terms specifically used in Peru are used in that uh, text? So, so on and so forth. And of course, um, you know, uh, it, it, even if something is said to be used in Peru, um, if, if it's not exclusively used in that place, you might want to uh, consider if it, if it might be possible to add certain uncertainty to the functions. So let's say use the Peruvian form with probability 0.5. It, it won't be that simple, of course, but um, it, it's certainly something that um, in, the, in the presence of alternatives in your language, you might want to consider ha having support for. So for example, let's talk about uh, east west east differences in, in Bengali. So Bengali is spoken not just in Bangladesh, but in the Indian state of West Bengal. And, and in fact, the standardized variety is that is originating from, from that variety spoken in Kolkata. It was spread across the rest of uh, Bengal. So between those, there's of course some simple word choices that may be significantly different between the two. We have um, for the word 20 in, on the, in the west, they say kuri, and then the east, they say bish. Uh, my parents are from the east, so uh, I learned bish. Um, certain conjugations of verbs can be realized differently. So, um, you know, in, 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 for a particular non finite form of kora to do, uh, there's korie in the west, and then in the east, it frequently turns into koire in standardized speech. Uh, this is again a standardized distinction. I mean, there's, of course, regional varieties in Bengal. But I'm not talking about those necessarily. It's just that specific conjugation is realized differently in the East. 
Uh, transcribing words from other languages may differ depending on uh, the phonologies of the questions in, in question, of the languages in question, or the varieties in question. So, for example, we have the father of the Swedish nation, as, as I've read that this king is called. Um, he might be referred to as Gustav Vasa in the West, but because of how um, phones have merged in the East, it might be turned into Gustav Bacha uh, for that same king. Um, or at least that, that's how it would be read in the West. In the East, it would still be read uh, Gustav, Gustav Vasa. Um, but again, phonology changes. And of course, in certain situations, if it's more useful for generating a particular text, certain regionalisms might be pulled in. Um, so I've learned that in uh, the far west, uh, the term gabda is used for a word meaning stupid, dull, etc. Whereas in uh, the far east, like in, around Silet, the term akaboka exists apparently. Um, yeah, these these uh, regionalisms that you learn about. Um, especially speaking as someone who has not lived in these regions, um, make, make you think a lot about how, might, how you might, uh, you know, adjust your functions to work with um, regional varieties. Um, so these are just some considerations in terms of, okay, if we wanted to generate a particularly Western Bengali version of a text versus an Eastern one, how might we make this difference uh, explicit? Um, and this last uh, part is possibly controversial, but just in terms of how do we manage pluricentric varieties of languages? Um, and there's like a couple of different ways this could be this could be gone. So there's Englishes, Spanishes, et cetera. You know, you might have um, some functions that are applicable to all of the Englishes in the world um, and use those in all cases. But for those differences, which are specific to say British English or Australian English or Canadian English, you might have some different functions that apply to those. Um, in addition, and you, those might entail, okay, picking Brit forms that are marked British English or senses that are marked British English and so on and so forth. Um, so for those, it might be possible to still have a set of functions marked English, but then just have different branches that are taken um, depending on the amount of regionalism desired in that particular case. Um, and the, the second case is places where there's like a difference across a in these are, there's a difference that exists across the international border, such as Hindustani or Punjabi. Uh, in that case, much of the grammatical um, structure is going to be practically identical between the two, um, the two varieties of each of these languages. Um, you know, so Hindustani has Hindi and Urdu, Punjabi has the version spoken in India and the version spoken in Pakistan. Um, between those uh, varieties, there might be, uh, there's an argument to be made for keeping as much of the functions general as possible except at those levels where, you know, Hindi is written in the Devanagari script, Urdu is written in the Arabic script. So at those levels where script and word choice make some difference in terms of processing, then that's where you might want to introduce a difference because of, of course um, there's the phenomenon of Hizafe and Urdu that manifests very differently in Urdu than it does in Hindi in terms of writing writing it down. I, I emphasize writing it down that makes it is different. Um, but it, of course, the pronounce speaking it is it yields the same result. So at those levels, you might want to have a slight difference. Um, and um, in this third bullet point for languages, which um, which uh, I, I'm not going to name because I don't want to start a war here. But uh, I'm emphasizing that for those languages, it's there. There's an argument to be made for having those share as many functions as possible among themselves. I, I, I should say not not. I'm not saying that the Shakabian standards should have the same functions as the siblings of Dari, but the siblings of Dari should have a similar set of functions and possibly lexemes, preferably. And deviating only when that's really necessary and important for the generation of text. And all in all, the less unnecessary desynchronization, the more likely better the text will be and the more accessible the text will be. You know, the less work we have to do, the more we can make things accessible across languages. Um, so I've run through a lot of stuff in the last half hour, uh, lots of different aspects of natural language generation preparation. Uh, you should remember though that uh, throughout this talk that neither of these, uh, neither abstract Wikipedia nor wiki functions actually exist yet. Um, and the, the, the prototypes and uh, alpha versions that exist, the, the test environments that they expose might be different from what wiki functions actually turns into. And so what preparations you might have now in terms of statements on lexemes and so on and so forth could might be better migrated to functions or or, vi or vice versa. And if uh, you're very unlucky, and I'm hoping no one's that unlucky, you might have to overhaul your entire lexeme plan um, in terms of, uh, okay, I 
created 100,000 forms, maybe I only need 100 uh, and, and procedurally generate the rest. That being said, I'm hoping that the considerations that I have highlighted in this presentation when actioned on uh, right now can put your language in a better spot later so that you don't have to make as many changes and you are able to uh, you know, build functions very quickly to do these things uh, that I've described. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, thanks again to the Archipelag organizers for uh, letting me present on this issue. Uh, there's a lot of places where we can continue the conversation about lexicographical data um, in different places. So, um, and I will be happy to address questions on the etherpad and you know, other forums about this issue. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you very much, Mahir. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, yes, like I said, uh, you're on Telegram pretty much constantly, right? So, uh, so ask him there if if you have any questions.